Hey guys, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank God. Uh, who said yeah? Me. Mo uh, Tony. Mo yeah. Thank you, Tony. Anybody else? Is anybody else there? Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Guys, I am so sorry. I, you, you can't even understand how ticked off I am about this whole thing. And it wasn't the way I thought this was supposed to go. I didn't think that one person getting COVID would cause us to go on to a, to, to be on a Zoom meeting. But there we are, okay? Looks like I have 17 people in here. Dominic, you're not in class. You don't need a mask. Dominic. Hello. You're not in class. You don't need a mask. Yeah, I'm in the uh, lobby area outside the elevator. Ah. So. so I am very, very sorry, guys. This is going to affect lecture and it's going to affect lab. Uh -huh. Lab, not so much. We're going to deal the, the lab tonight was gonna be a very simple lab anyway, okay? It was going to be basically two experiments and I gotta make up information since I've been working since 12 o'clock. I gotta make up the information for the dry lab data to give you, okay? So I will get that to you and uh, I will make sure that you have plenty of time to do that. Fair enough, ladies and gentlemen? Fair enough. Just have two questions. Go ahead, uh, Tony. So first one, will the get, will, okay, people around the person who got COVID, will they get like an email? Yes. To get... Yes, you're not, you are not. You're fine, Tony. Okay. I believe you're fine. Okay. And the other question is about the lab. So since I was going to come in today to do Monday's lab, that's not going to work, obviously. Yes. Um, uh, Monday's lab. That was the. Uh, you cut. No, wait, wait. You missed Monday, Tony. Yeah, I was like, yeah, I'm gonna show up today. You can't. We can't do that because remember, Wednesday's labs are now before us. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, in other words, today Wednesday's lab is doing Le Chatelier. You were looking for uh, equilibrium constant, correct? Yeah. Uh, talk to me after class. We'll deal with it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Any other questions by anybody? Uh, I, the extra credit for the test. Yep. That's that was due today. Yeah, I, I understand that. Guys, you're just going to hand it in to me. You're going to hand it in to me when when we next meet. Okay. So just all right. That fair enough. It's not like we can't go onto campus. As a matter of fact, I'm going on to campus tomorrow to tutor. And I believe I emailed you, Dana. Did you get it? Dana? I don't, I, I don't think I saw. Basically, I emailed you and told you that if you want your test, that uh, it can be available to you. Uh, if you go to the SU building, do you know where the tutoring is? Yeah. What, um, what time? I'm there from uh, 1 till 5 tomorrow. Okay. Okay. Let me let me just give me a second, guys. Uh, I just want to see who else. That person doesn't matter. I don't think that is Quanesha here tonight. Quanesha. Quanesha or Circe. Okay. No problem. Dana, just come to pick up your test tomorrow then. And just like everybody else, we'll turn it in when we get notification. Now, I haven't even had the chance to see the email regarding what my requirements are. I suspect we may not be meeting for another 10 days until the, since that person was last in the lab on the 30th, on the 20th, I believe we'll be able to start meeting again on the 30th. Again, don't trust me on that. I will, I will let you know as I know. Fair enough. But just turn your tests in next time we meet. 
Anything else? Anything else in terms of uh, what we're doing, what we're messing around with tonight? Um, Mr. P, I, on the email that I got, it says all classrooms are cleaned and disinfected. Your course will move to a live online format until September 27th. There we go. That, uh, that's an absolute asinine thing. So the 27th, you got that email? Yeah, I got that email from Natalia Middleton or Nateva. I'm sorry. That's fine. So next Monday. So Who is Nateva? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Nativia is your dean. Okay. Hmm. Dr. Middleton. I, I would wait. Wait until you hear from me, okay? Yeah. So uh, uh, I'm sorry. I haven't, I haven't met Dana. I haven't had a chance. I'm sorry. I, had, good. I, I was just reading you what I got. I had a half an hour between coming back from Hillsboro and being here. And I'm sorry. I watched a Rays game. <laughs> I'll be perfectly honest with you. I didn't bother doing the emails. So I will look at the emails. I'll talk with uh, the department chair tomorrow and we'll see if it's the 27th. Okay. So I'm hoping for that, which would mean that those people with the Monday lab are going to get to do the lab in person. Uh, those people with today's lab, I may work something out with you, okay? Uh, let me see what I can do. I may have you do the graphing lab now, which is a dry lab anyway. Don't be yawning on me, Lana. Don't, don't yawn. Dear God, it's bad enough my staying awake this long anyway. Okay, we, we good, guys? Any other questions? Okay, so I got to share screen. Are you seeing, are you seeing the uh, uh, PowerPoint, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so I think that we got as far as talking about how to manipulate the constants. Isn't that correct, ladies and gentlemen? We got to this slide, right? Uh, yeah, we did. Ah, crap, 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 crap. Ah. I'm sorry, I'm manipulating this. Okay, admit all. Okay, and by the way, this will be recorded. If you have lab tonight, uh, the Zoom meeting for the lab tonight will not be, will not be held until um, 7.30. I need to have a half an hour to upload this. Okay, slideshow, current slide. Okay, we went through all those, right? We went through all of those, uh, all of those slides, correct, ladies and gentlemen? Any, yes. quest any questions on how to manipulate equilibrium constants when we are messing with the reactions themselves? Bottom line. If, I, if you reverse the reaction, the equilibrium constant is the inverse. And it makes sense because what you're doing is you're making the products the reactants. So the products now go on top and the reactants now go on the bottom. So bottom line of this one, K forward is equal to one over K reverse. If we double or if we multiply the equation by any number, what we do is we raise the equilibrium constant to that exponent. In other words, if we double the reaction then we square the original constant. If we multiply the reaction by three, 
we take the original equilibrium constant and raise it to the third power. If I have two different reactions and I, add, and I can add those reactions up to equal a third reaction, like for example, in this reaction, I have A plus B yielding C plus D and C plus E yielding B plus F. If you look very carefully, if I add these two reactions, I can eliminate Bs and I can eliminate Cs so I can get a plus E yields D plus F. In that case, if I know what my equilibrium constant is from the first reaction and the second reaction, the new equilibrium constant will be a multiplication of the two. Is there any, any questions on those? Okay. Now, this is something that I really didn't mention when I was talking about equilibrium constants at first. But we got to deal with uh, heterogeneous equilibrium. All right, let's think about this. When we get a density of something, isn't density grams per milliliter? Or isn't density kind of like concentration? I need to have a yes, man. Yes. Thank you so much. So density is like a concentration. But the thing is, as you deplete from like a solid or a liquid, as you deplete from that, the density doesn't change, right? Yeah. So the density is staying constant. So since the density is staying constant, when you have a solid or or a pure liquid, essentially, you don't, they don't figure into the equilibrium constant. So like, if I was looking at lead chloride dissolving into lead ions and chloride ions, all I have to deal with are the lead ions and the chloride ions. I don't have to deal with the solid lead chloride and I don't have to deal with the water it's put in. So that my constant in this reaction is gonna be just the lead ion and just the concentration of the chloride ion quantity squared. Questions about that? If it was, if those were the um, reactants instead of the products, would it be one over or would it yes. still just be? Yes, exactly. Oh. Okay. Exactly. Because they would then be the reactants and you would do the products, but the products, since it's a constant, would be one over those two particular constants or concentration. Are we good, ladies and gentlemen? Yes. That's true as long as you have some of the liquid or solid remaining. If you don't have some of the solid or liquid remaining, then what happens is the two ions get together to make some of it. So as long as you have some calcium carbonate and some calcium oxide in this reaction, as long as some of that material remains, our constant is just gonna be equal to the concentration of my CO2. Now, we got to deal with something called the reaction quotient. Some reactions aren't at equilibrium, right? Yes. Their equilibrium is a process that all reactions are trying to go towards, correct? Yeah. But in the means of it getting going towards the equilibrium, I can still figure out the concentration of my items, correct? Yeah. So what I'm going to do, what the reaction quotient is, is the product of all the concentrations when they're not at equilibrium. 
what we're going to be able to do is we're going to be able to look at that number and we're going to be able to compare it to the equilibrium constant. And based upon the relationship, we'll be able to say whether we're going to make more products or we're going to make more reactants. So it's the same thing. It's the same expression as the equilibrium is, only we're not at equilibrium. So the concentrations, when they're multiplied, do not equal K, they equal Q. So if I have a reaction of a known KC, I can determine which way the reaction goes by calculating the concentrations and determining what my Q is. I can then get my Q, compare it to K and determine whether my reaction is going forward or whether it's going in reverse. Okay, look at this reaction. If I have more nitrogen and more hydrogen, if I add more nitrogen and more hydrogen, what happens to my number that I'm calculating? It gets smaller. The number gets smaller. So in other words, my QC is smaller than my equilibrium. Well, my equilibrium doesn't like it. My equilibrium wants to be in equilibrium. So what it's going to do at that point is it's going to react the nitrogen and the hydrogen to make ammonia. So when I am making more ammonia, my Q is getting higher and higher I'm making ammonia depleting N2H2. So the number I am calculating is getting closer and closer to K until it becomes K. So when my Q is less than KC, what happens is I get a net forward reaction. If I have too much NH3. I'm sorry, this is bugging me. If I have too much NH3, ah, crap. I think that's what happened before. I think it's too hard to fix it. This is NH3, not NH. If I have too much NH3, what happens is I want to deplete my NH3 because I want to get my Q value equal to my equilibrium. So if my NH3 is too big, I want to get rid of it and I want to make N2H2. So when that happens, I am forcing it in the reverse direction. So if K equals Q, I'm at equilibrium. In other words, if I don't know what my K real value really is, or I'm sorry, if I do know what my K value really is and I multiply my concentrations and those concentrations end up being equal to Q, I'm at equilibrium. These, ne these next three slides are fairly important, guys. If Q equals K, I am at equilibrium. If Q is bigger than K, what we want to do is we want to reduce that number. Understand, we got products over reactants. So if Q is bigger than K, I want to reduce Q. The way I reduce Q is to get rid of the numerator, which is the products, and I make more of the denominator, which is the reactants. I'm going in the reverse direction. The reaction is moving to the left. 
On the other hand, if K is bigger than Q, that means I don't have enough in my numerator. That means I need more products. I need to also deplete my reactants. So the way I do that is I cause more of the reaction of my reactants to making my products. So when K is bigger than Q, my reaction goes to the right. I am going in a forward direction. Anybody confused about that? Come on, guys. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just kind of confused about how you're going to get two different numbers. Is it just going to be like part of the problem? Yes. Is that you have, oh, okay. We're going to show that in a second. What happens in a problem like this is part of the problem will be that I give you K. I give you K and I give you the concentrations of the individual reactants and products. Then what I do is I ask you, is the reaction at equilibrium? Is it going forward or is it going in reverse? My K for this reaction is 279. My SO2 concentration is five E to the minus three, oxygen 1.9 E to the minus three, and SO3 6.9 E to the minus three. What I have to do with this particular problem is I have to find out what my Q is. Remember, the, the expression is just the same. The only difference is Q is not at equilibrium, K is at equilibrium. So what I'm gonna do for this reaction, I'm gonna take my SO2 concentration, square it, and I'm gonna divide it by my, I'm sorry, back off, excuse me. I'm gonna take my SO3 concentration, square it, divide that by my SO2 concentration squared, times my O2 concentration. I do that math out and I end up with my Q value being 1002. I compare that, I compare my Q with my K. Q is bigger than K. So I got to get rid of products and make reactants. If I have to get rid of products, this means my reaction is going in reverse. My reaction is going to the left. Are we good about that, ladies and gentlemen? I am. Any confusion, guys? Okay, for the reaction, carbon monoxide plus two hydrogens making uh, methanol. My KC is, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sitting here trying to figure out whether this is balanced and it is. My KC at 14.5 degrees is, I'm sorry, my KC is 14.5 at 500K. Guys. Figure out the Q. I'm going to give you about five minutes or so. Figure out what Q is and determine whether it's at equilibrium or not. Be back.
Okay, how are we doing, guys? Is anybody out there? Guys? Yeah. Thank you. Thank God somebody's out there. How do we do with this? What number did you come up with? Remember, it's in a 10 liter vessel. That means every one of those moles that you see up there need to be divided by 10. So we have 0 0.150 molarity of H2, 0 0.100 molarity of CO, and 0 0.05 molarity of C3OH. Anybody come up with a number? Guys? I did not. Anybody else? Noah said something in the group chat. Okay, thank you. He said you. Q is 22.2. And he would be right. So all we're doing, we had to change because these are all moles in a 10 liter vessel. We had to change those to make, to make, reflect the actual concentration. So we had to divide all the moles by 10, plug it into the expression. We end up with 22.2. It's bigger than KC, therefore, I've got too much product, therefore, my reaction is going to shift left. Okay, guys, we're going to get into some, we're going to start to get into some harder equations now. Are we good with this? We good with Q's and K's? Yeah. Now we're going to figure out what the equilibrium constants are using KC and my initial concentrations. I have my old friendly reaction here. H2 plus I2 yielding 2HI. My KC is 55.6. If H2 originally and I2 originally equal 0.1 molar and we don't have any HI, what are their concentrations at equilibrium? Again, we're going to deal with this using an ice diagram, just like we did before. So we have our initial concentrations of 0 0.1, 0 0.1, and zero. For kicks and giggles, I'm going to call my amount of equilibrium HI that I produce 2x. Can I choose x, ladies and gentlemen? Could I choose x? Hold on one second, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, Christine. Uh, okay. It's nothing, nothing here. I, I,
So sorry, guys, that was important. That had to do with the lab. Okay. All right, I'll throw that question out again. I just happened to call my HI concentration at equilibrium 2x. Could I have just as easily called it x? I don't know. Trevor said definitely. <laughs> if Trevor says it, you got to listen to him. It yeah. doesn't matter. It's just x, okay? It's just some variable. The reason I chose 2x is instead of having my change be minus a half x and minus a half x, my change is going to be minus x and minus x. That seemed to, that seemed to be make, making sense? Yes. So that's the whole reason I called that 2x. Now, if I subtract x from both of my h2 and i2, I get 0 0.100 minus x and 0 0.100 minus x. Everybody understand the ice table? Guys? I'm hearing a whole lot of nothing out of a lot of you. Are you just bearing with me? Or are you, have you just logged on and... Can you, explain, can you explain, can you explain again how uh, you got 2x in the last row? Okay, I knew. I knew that the amount of HI I created is gonna be twice as the amount of these two, right? Okay, that makes sense. So instead of just calling it X, I called it 2X and use these as X. If I would have chosen X as opposed to 2X, it would have been the same thing, only these two values would be minus half X. Makes sense. Okay, thank you. So when I go to do the calculation here, I have 2X quantity squared over 0 0.100 minus x quantity squared. I have a square over a square. So I can solve this easily because I can take the square root of both sides. Square root of 55.6 is 7.46. And that now is equal to 2x over 0 0.100 minus x. I carry this, uh, multiply both sides by 0 0.100 minus x. This gives me these, these two values. I then add 7.46 to both sides. I end up with x being 0 0.0789. So my concentrations of H2 and I2 are 0 0.0211. Remember guys, I had to take 0 0.100 and subtract X from it. So that's how I got 0 0.0211. But my X times two is my value for my HI. So I take this, multiply it two. That's how I got the 0.158. Questions, ladies and gentlemen? No. Okay, that was a real nice and easy one because I had squares. Let's have another problem. I have different concentrations of I2 and Cl2. And my equilibrium constant is 5.2. How much iCl do I produce? Well, my initial values are two, four, and zero. Again, my product, I'm making 2x. So the change for ICL is plus 2x, but my change for I2 and CL2 are minus x. So that my equilibrium concentrations of I2 and CL2 are 2 minus x and 4 minus x. My equilibrium concentration of ICL is 2x. Questions? Okay, my equilibrium expression is going to be 
two X quantity squared over two minus X times four minus X. I go ahead and solve this. 5.2 is four X squared divided by eight minus six point X plus X squared. I multiply that all out and I end up with a polynomial down at the bottom. 1.2 X squared minus 31.2 X plus 41.6. I cannot factor that. Guess what we have to do, ladies and gentlemen? Quadratic equation. You guessed it. <laughs> so I now have to use the quadratic X is equal to minus B plus or minus square root of B squared minus four AC all divided by two A. I plug those values in and my first result is 24.6. That's an absurd result because that would have meant that I used up more than I had originally. So I can throw that result out. My other result is 1.4. I hate it, quadratic equations. Does anybody like doing them? No. So would you be really happy if I showed you a way to get out of doing it? Yes. That is called the 5% rule. Now, if K equilibrium is really, really small, do I make much product? No. I don't make much product. So. I'm, my X value is not very big, is it? No. So if I have one minus X, and if X is really, really dinky, don't I have one? Yeah. So that's what we're going to do. We, if the difference between my equilibrium constant and the initial concentrations, is about three orders of magnitude or more. Make X zero. Otherwise, if you want to, go for it. Do the quadratic. Let's see how this is going to work. I have a reaction, I2 in equilibrium with two I's. Okay, we're going to do A first, in which my KC is 2.9 times 10 to the minus 10. Now, Legitimately speaking, legitimately speaking, my KC is a very, very small number. Do I make much I? No. I want to hear some other voice other than who's, who's, who's my yes person? Dana. Dana, thank you very much. I want to hear another voice. If KC is very, very small, do I make much I? Michael said no. <laughs> is Michael shy? I don't know. Michael's been typing. Some people Guys, just type in a group chat. Michael is Noah. I understand, I, I understand that guys, but I can't see the chat while I've got my, while I've got my uh, um, slide projector on. I can't I'll read see it, it to you if somebody says something. Thank you so much. But Trevor did ask in the beginning, if he gave you the bonus test on Monday, will it be graded sooner than next week? <laughs> the next meeting. Oh dear God. <laughs> you missed that one. Tell him, no, he can wait for his three points. <laughs> or excuse me, no, no, it's not even three points. It's one and a half points. Jesus. Yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> he did that whole test for one and a half points. Can you believe it? <laughs> points right. are points. Points are points. 
Okay, so if I look at this and I do my ice diagram, I've got 0.5 moles in a two and a half liter vessel. That's a 0.20 molar solution. So my initial concentration of I2 is 0.20, of I is zero. If my I is 2X, then I lose X amount of my I2. So this is how this is going to work. I've got my K equilibrium here. I've got my I2 below it. My I2 is 2X quantity squared. My I2 is 0.2 minus X. And that's all equal to this very, very small number, right? So what if, what if I just say, what if I just say X is zero? X is nearly zero anyway. And so if I, if I have X being a dinky number, 0.2 minus a dinky number is still going to be 0.2. So what we're going to do is we're just going to call X zero. And we're going to solve it. We're going to solve it like we normally would. We're going to put 2X squared over 0.2 is equal to 2.9 times 10 to the minus 10. Sorry, I'm letting people in. Okay. I get the number for X being 3.83 times 10 to the minus six. How do I figure out if it's valid? What I'm going to do is I'm gonna take the amount of X and I'm going to compare it to the amount I subtracted X from. There was my X. This is what I subtracted it from. And I multiply it by 100. I end up with 0.19%. When I subtract the number, I'm sorry, when I take the number I'm subtracting from the number and put it over the number and multiply by 100. If that number is 5% or greater, I can't do this estimation. I have to do the quadratic. If the number is 5% or less, is less than 5%, I can use it. So if you remember, my X value was 3.83 times 10 to the minus six. The number I was subtracting it from was 0 0.20. So I take the number that was subtracting it from, from the number itself, multiply by 100. It's less than 5%. I have a valid re result. Questions about that? People hate doing this at first because it's like, oh my God, I'm throwing away a number. I'm throwing away a variable. I can't do that. Yes, you can. You can when that number is, or that variable is insignificant. Questions on this, ladies and gentlemen. I have acetic acid in water that's going to make H3O plus and acetate. Remember, we said that water is a pure liquid, a heterogeneous equilibrium. Water doesn't count in the equilibrium expression. So my equilibrium expression is actually H3O plus times acetate divided by acetic acid. Now, what this is saying is it was originally 0.210 molar acetic acid. 
I don't know what H3O, uh, H3O concentration and acetate concentration are not mentioned in this equation. Therefore, assume they're zero. If I make, if I make X amount of H3O and X amount of acetate, then I use up X amount of my acetic acid. Make that into my equilibrium equation. Kc is X times X divided by 0 0.210 minus X. If I forget the X, that simplifies my expression to my Kc value, 1.8 e to the minus fifth is equal to X squared divided by 210. My X turns out to be 9.26 e to the minus third. If I subtract that X value, I'm sorry, if I divide that X value by the number I was going to originally subtract it from and multiply by 100, I get 4.4%. Less than 5%, I can drop the X. Any questions, ladies and gentlemen? Are we good here? I'm hearing crickets, guys. Yes. Oh uh, wait, I have a I have a question really quick. So do you only do you only make the x zero and you can forget the x only on the denominator, right? No. Stop it. No, you can do it everywhere. Just keep yes, it if it happens to be in the numerator, you can do it there as well. Okay. Got another problem. I got two point five e to the minus two molar H two S and an equilibrium constant of 1.67 e to the minus seven. Look at my difference between my equilibrium concentration and my H2S concentration. That's more than an order of three. I'll be able to subtract X from it or disregard the subtracted X. So I have zero H2, zero S2, and I have my original concentration of H2S. Again, I'm going to use the 2X. This is 2X, this is 2X, that becomes X. 2X added, 2X added. So I have my equilibrium expression is going to be 2X times X divided by 0 0.0250 minus 2X. Now look, if X is dinky, 2X is also dinky. So I'm going to assume that X is negligible. That changes the expression to this. I solve that, X ends up being 2.97 e to the minus four. Divide that by the number I was subtracting it from. I get 1.19, less than 5%, I can use it. Okay, I've just introduced a new concept here, guys. Are we good with it? I think so. I think I'm good. Any questions anywhere, ladies and gentlemen? Why does the numerator not completely cancel out? if X is meant to be disregarded. Okay, X is, only dis X is only insignificant if I'm subtracting it from a large number. If I am, if it's there by itself, it is significant. Okay. All right, God, let me give you an example. If you spit, if you spit, if you hold spit in your mouth, is that a significant amount? No. No? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> if, you, if you hold enough spit in your mouth, you're going to drown. Right? Uh, okay, yeah. 
yet if you put that spit in the ocean, it doesn't mean a damn, right? Yeah. So the spit in your mouth is like the X being by themselves. The spit in the ocean is like subtracting it from the ocean. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. I got, I got time. Absolutely, I got lots of time. Are we doing okay, guys? Do we kind of understand what's going on here? Yes. Yes. All right, now we're gonna deal with something called Le Chatelier's Principle. And it basically says, if you have something under equilibrium and you stress that equilibrium, what is gonna happen is that the equilibrium is gonna react such that it relieves the stress and gets back to equilibrium. That's bottom line, what Le Chatelier is saying. The things we're gonna consider, the factors we're gonna consider that involve Le Chatelier's principle are concentration of reactants and products, temperature and pressure slash volume if gases are involved. All right, let's think about this. If I have a system at equilibrium and I take something away from one side, my reaction is going to want to go back towards making more of the stuff I took away to get back to equilibrium. I'm on a seesaw, guys. I want to get back to that nice level level of the seesaw. Only I have some jerk that's over here that's pushing up with their legs so that when I get down, I can push up with my legs. The equilibrium reacts until we get back on that nice steady level. On the consequence, if I add something to that equilibrium, the system is going to react in such a way as to use up what I've added. Okay, bottom line. If I have my equilibrium here, A plus B yields C plus D, and I add more A, Because I have added A to the reactant side, that forces the equilibrium to the right. On the other hand, if I add more C, that means that I've got too many products. That means that my reaction is going to shift to the right. Do you remember the cues, Scott, ladies and gentlemen? Do you remember what we said about the cues? If you don't want to think about it in this fashion, let's think about it numerically. If I figure out what Q is, Q is equal to C plus D divided by A plus B, right? Yes. If I add more C, does my Q go up? Yes. Q is now bigger than KC. Remember what we said a few minutes ago. If Q is bigger than KC, the reaction wants to get rid of the products and make more reactants. So if I add C, the reaction shifts to the left. On the other hand, if I add more A, that makes, my, that makes my Q smaller. Because my Q is smaller, I want to make more product and use up my reactant. So my reaction is going to shift to the right with that. Do I add like 20 
so like if you think of it in terms of equilibrium the equilibrium like won't change but the q will want to change to match the equilibrium kind of sort of yeah okay the q, the q forces the q forces the rate of reaction to increase in one direction or the other until the numbers equal themselves again and we're at equilibrium again. Does um, that kind of make sense? Yeah. Do you think you could, um, I don't know why, but I'm kind of thinking of osmosis. Could you compare it to that at all? Yes, because what's happening in osmosis is you're getting the more dilute sample being forced in the more concentrated sample so that they end up having the same concentration. So yes, I'll buy that. I'll buy that analogy. Okay. Okay, I have my same equilibrium. If I take away B, then my equilibrium is gonna to want to react such that it makes more B. If I take away, so it's gonna to react to, to make more B. The way it makes more B is it shifts in the reverse direction. If I take away D, I want the, re the reaction is gonna to, going to wanna to go so that it makes more D to make up for the depletion. So it's going to make more D by pushing the reaction to the right. Again, if we want to think about Qs, if I take away B, I'm taking away some of the reactants, which is going to make the number bigger. The way I make the number smaller again is to deplete my products and make more B. So it shifts it back to the left. If I take away D, this means my Q is smaller than K. If my Q is smaller than K, then I need to build up my products and deplete my reactants. The way I do this is to force the reaction to go to the right. How are you doing with this so far? I think pretty good. Okay, now we're gonna get into something that you gotta think a little bit about. Do you remember the um, kinetic theory? Kinetic theory, of the gas loss. Crickets. Not really. Major mit. Thank you so much for being honest. <laughs> All right. Do you know what pressure is? Yeah. Okay. What is pressure? Um. What keeps a balloon expanded? Uh, confined volume and it's all the gas particles bouncing off the surface of the liquid. Thank you so much. <laughs> all right, so we got gas particles that are bouncing off the surface of the balloon. That's what's keeping the balloon expanded. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. If I have more particles, is that balloon going to expand more or is it going to contract? Expand. More particles, expansion. Keep that in mind for the moment. The other thing we got to keep in mind is as we decrease the volume, we increase the pressure. Now, we have to look at what is happening in the reaction. And we're specifically looking at the gas molecules. I have a reaction here. 2SO2 plus O2 makes 2SO3. Which side has more particles on it? Oh, 
the left side? I got two SO2s and one O2. I got three particles on the left compared to two on the right. Okay, now think about what Le Chatelier says. The reaction, the equilibrium is going to react to relieve the stress. If I put pressure, if I put more pressure on this reaction, which side would relieve the pressure? The side that has three particles on it or the side that has two on it? The side with two. So what's gonna happen as my pressure increases? my reaction is going to shift to the right. Now, contrary to that, if I decrease the pressure of my reaction, I'm gonna to wanna to make more particles to get that pressure back up. So in that case, when I decrease the pressure, my equilibrium is going to shift to the left because there are more particles on the left. Are we good with that logic, ladies and gentlemen? Yes. Consider this reaction. If, okay, if I increase the pressure here, which way is the reaction going to shift? Left. Because there are less particles on the left. If I decrease the pressure, if I decrease the pressure on this reaction, is it going to shift left or right? Right. All right. Now something you can't read off the screen. <laughs> what happens when I increase the volume? Shifts right. Why? Um, pressure and volume have indirect. Volume, volume is increased. When the volume increased, what, what effect does that have on the pressure? It goes down. Indirect relationship. Pressure goes down. If the pressure goes down, do you want more particles or less particles? More. So it's going to shift to the right. Congruently to that, if my pressure, if my volume decreases, what effect does that have on the pressure? Pressure goes up. If pressure goes up, do I want more particles or less particles? Less. So when the volume decreases, I get a net shift of my reaction to the left. Now, look at those reactions. Do I have a net increase in particles? Left side, right side. No. I don't have a net effect of, uh, a no net increase or decrease in particles. Therefore, pressure is not gonna change either one of these reactions. Caveat, ladies and gentlemen, be careful. You need to look at the little symbols. Make sure that all the little symbols are gases. Because if I got a solid or liquid in here, they are going to have no effect on pressure. Are we good with that? Yes. All right, we dealt with pressure, which is the harder of the two. Now we got to consider temperature. 
Riddle me this. When I have an exothermic reaction, is heat produced? Yes. So it's yes. kind of a product, isn't it? Heat. If I, if I have an exothermic reaction, you just said I'm producing heat. My question is, it's kind of a product then, isn't it? Yeah. If I have an endothermic reaction. It's a reactant. It's, I need to absorb, my reactants need to absorb heat to make the reaction go. So the heat becomes a reactant. So if you think of it like that, these questions are easy. If you have an exothermic reaction, heat's produced, heat is a product. If you have an endothermic reaction, heat is absorbed, heat is a reactant. So in this particular reaction, I have an exothermic reaction. So heat is one of my products. If I add heat, isn't that kind of like adding more of one of my products? Yeah. So if I'm adding more of one of my products, isn't it going to shift the equilibrium, in this case, to the left? Yes. I take away heat. That's kind of like taking away one of my products. And so that's going to make the reaction go towards it. I have an endothermic reaction. That means that my reaction is, my heat is one of my reactants. So if I add more heat to it, am I gonna make more products or am I gonna make more reactants? Products. Because I'm adding to one of my reactants, which is heat. On the other hand, if I have an endothermic reaction and I take heat away, which way does the reaction shift? To the left. To the left to make up more heat. Okay. Now's the time to turn your ears on and your mics on. Ben Davis. Ben Davis, you out there? Okay. We'll deal with Ben Leedy. Carson. Yes, sir. Okay. This one we've already done. This next reaction, do you see it? Yeah, I see it. PCL5, PC, PCL5 in equilibrium with PCL3 and CL2. Okay. Well, there are, there are more, uh, more particles on the right side. Okay. By, so reactions, by reactions favoring, I want to force the reaction to the product side. So you would de you would, it would favor low pressures. Absolutely correct. More particles are on the on the right side. Let's see who else is here. Dominic. Hello. It's also 646, by the way. Oh, it is? Yep. My clock says 644, but it's slow. Okay, guys, this is where we're gonna start off on Monday. Hopefully we will be together. If you have me for lab tonight, if you have me for lab tonight, then beware that I will be up, I will be online at 7.30, okay? Okay? Okay. I got you for lab. Okay. All right. <laughs> I will see you guys, some of you later, others of you. I hope to see you in person on Monday. Here's open. Uh, Dana, awesome. are you going to drop by tomorrow? Yeah, I am. Okay, good. Good. Gonna make sure I have your 
your tests. Okay, see you later, guys. Professor, I have a quick question. I'm here. What are we doing about turning in the extra credit? Next time we meet. Okay. Next time we meet in person. Okay. And did this whole thing get recorded? I'm, I'm hoping. Okay. Me too. <laughs> Thank so. you. Bye. <laughs> All right. See you soon. Can, can Professor, we, uh, I, I got a quick question. Tom? Go ahead, Tom. Um, the quick question is, are we meeting on Monday for the lab? Tomas, I'll be honest with you. I had from, I got told at 1215 that I was doing a Zoom meeting tonight. Okay? okay. I have had a half an hour to eat my dinner tonight. And during which time I was watching the Rays game, Tomas. So I have not had a chance to look at the email. All right, that's know. fine. I don't know. Let us know. I promise I will as soon as I know. Thank you so much. Have a good one. You too. Uh, can we just talk about what I emailed you about with Have test no one on, on Monday? Oh, oh, I emailed you about one of the questions on test one. I think it was the last one on form A. Uh, Carson, uh, I will see about it on Monday, okay? No problem. Thank you so much. Have All a good right. one. One last thing before I go. Uh-huh. Uh, can I email Why you? Why the hell are lab? you guys so chatty now and you didn't <laughs> say a word during the lecture? Yeah. So for the lab, for Monday's lab, I was going to email you that, like, you know how in the live online classes, they watch something and they do the lab yes. results on it. Can I do something similar? Uh, Tony, right? Yeah. Uh, let me see if I have it. I, it may not have been uploaded into my course. Okay. All right. Good I enough. Good. Anything else, guys? No, I think we're good. All right. I have a phone call, so I got to get out. Bye. Okay, thank you. How do I get out of here?